Good morning, and welcome to worship with the Institute of Lutheran Theology. It's our Thursday morning chapel service. I'm Pastor David Patterson from Pioneer Lutheran Church in White, South Dakota. We gather in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our text for this morning is James chapter 2, verses 1 through 18. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, You sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, You stand over there, or sit down at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? Which he has promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, You are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For, the ju- for judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled. Without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith. And I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. The word of the Lord. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. What ought I to do as a Christian? How should I act? Should I eat these kinds of foods, or should I refrain from watching this kind of movie? Who should I associate with, and how should I treat others? In other words, how should a Christian act? In one form or another, you have heard and thought these same questions before. Some of these seem rather trivial, while others feel profoundly important. This is what James is addressing in our text for this morning. As one who holds the faith of Jesus Christ, James answers the question, how should I hold that faith of Jesus Christ? What James explains here is necessary to understand what it means to act like a Christian. 
first. James speaks of showing partiality to the rich over the poor. James writes, For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, You sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, You stand over there, or sit down at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? This is, by the way, the specific issue James is addressing in the congregation. Our text begins with, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. But what the text literally says is, Stop your showing partiality. Stop your showing partiality toward others as part of your holding the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious. You see, it appears that these people were showing partiality towards the rich because they saw them as blessed of God. Just as they held the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ the Glorious, as the text says, so they honored those whom their Lord had so gloriously blessed. Now this was a common notion in that day. People with great wealth appeared blessed to those around them. And the Lord is the font of every blessing, is he not? Therefore, it is reasonable to assume that they were rich because God had blessed them. And if God had blessed them, they must, been, must have been deserving of that blessing. You know, come to think of it, it's a fairly common notion today as well. But James told them that making these distinctions was wrong. James tells them that they made distinctions among themselves and had become judges with evil thoughts. He tells them to stop showing partiality to the rich. So does that mean they are to show partiality to the poor over the rich? Elevate the poor to a place of honor and put the rich at their feet? That's what he's saying, right? Right? Actually, no. He's not saying that at all. Remember, he tells them to stop showing partiality toward others as part of your holding the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious. He does not tell them to be partial to the poor over the rich. He tells them to stop showing partiality to others. You see, what makes them, the ju- makes them judges with evil thoughts is not that they were partial to the rich, but that they made distinctions in how they treated others. By making the distinction, they have made themselves literally judges with evil thoughts. But that is a problem. You see, remember... James repeats Jesus' declaration about the second half of the heart of the law. He says, if you really fulfill the royal law, according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. You can't just love them in principle, though. James says, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the the things needed for the body, what good is that? If you are to truly love your neighbor, you must do more than think nice things about them or even say 
nice things about them. You must do good works for them. But when you go past the heart and ask the question, how do I love my neighbor? You are asking what choices to make. Who do I choose to help? How do I choose to help them? By what criteria should I choose? That very question requires you to make a distinction. But James says, if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. What in effect he is saying to this congregation is, stop showing your good works toward others as part of your holding of the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ the Glorious. Okay then, no good works. Well, after all, are we not saved by grace through faith apart from any good works? So what's the problem? Well, James also says, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So first, James says, stop choosing good works as part of holding your faith in Jesus Christ. Then he says that faith without works is dead, or literally a dead faith. Are you confused yet? Well, you should be. In fact, the final statement in this morning's text says, but someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Now that sounds like he's saying that faith has to include works again, which is how many have interpreted it. But listen to it carefully. James says, show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my I'll show you my faith by my works. It sounds like James is saying, you can't show me your faith apart from your works, but I can show you my faith by my works. But again, we have a bit of a translation issue here. The word translated here as and, a very simple word, should actually be translated as likewise or in the same way. See, it's not the the standard word that we get in Greek for and. It's a different word. What James is doing is he's turning the whole thing around, you see. What he's actually saying is, no, you cannot show me your faith apart from your works. But likewise, I cannot show you my faith by my works. Works no works, it, it doesn't matter. Neither can provide evidence of your faith. Why? Because anything you choose to do, or not do for that matter, as a part of holding your faith in Jesus Christ is wrong. Why? Why? Because any faith you can hold and any faith you can show can only come from you. It is your faith. It comes from one who is dead in their trespasses and sins. And anything that comes from the dead is held by the dead is shown by the dead is itself dead. A dead faith shown through dead works. Living faith is only given by one who death could not show, who death could not hold. Living faith 
comes from the author of life itself, Jesus Christ, our glorious Lord, God the Son. The faith of Jesus is not something we hold. It's something which holds us. Jesus manifests his faith in us, and that faith takes hold of us, and that faith works good through us. Now, in our world today, when we think about how we interact with those around us, we tend to use two words interchangeably, ethics and morals. But these are two completely different concepts. You see, the ethical man is someone who knows right from wrong and chooses the right because he knows that it is right. For the truly moral man, there is no distinction to be made. The question of what is the right thing to do never even occurs to him. He does the right thing, not because it is the right thing, but simply as a natural, unexamined, unscrutinized outpouring of love for his neighbor. Now, anyone can choose to be ethical, but no one can choose to be moral. The moment you consider how to be moral, morality is no longer an option, only ethics. Ethics are an expression of the law. But morality is a pure expression of the love of the gospel. And it only results through the living faith of Jesus Christ. So what does this mean? It means that true living faith, the faith that brings eternal life, is not something that can be demonstrated. Anything that you could point to and say, Look! See that? That proves that I am saved. It could only be something of your own making and useless. All we can do is to cling to the promise of Jesus Christ. The promise that is ours through the cross. The promise that is ours through our baptism. Cling to the cross of Christ. His promise that He will save you. Cling to the promise of Jesus that through His death on the cross He has paid the debt for your sin and through His resurrection from the dead has conquered death itself. Cling to His promise that through His faith, given to you by the grace of the Father, eternal life is yours. So, should we do good works? Well, certainly. But not because they show our faith or our evidence for our faith, but because our neighbor needs them. And perhaps when you're not watching, when you're not aware, when you least expect it, the living faith that holds you will work its good through you. So, yes, in this world today, choose to do good for your neighbor, every neighbor. But most of all, Cling to the cross of Jesus Christ and his promise that when he returns in the fullness of time and we join him and are made new, 
we will no longer need to choose to do good. Just cling to the cross. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.